Well, before we get everything restarted, <laughs> I would like to thank you for having me here. Uh, I am very, very sorry right now that I don't speak German because I, from what I could understand, just some fragments, it seemed like a very interesting topic. And maybe I will touch upon some ideas in my presentations without me even knowing it. But um, the scope of my presentation is mostly to make a short inquiry to present uh, the bare bones of what Nishida writes about art uh, from a mostly chronological point of view, first of all. And then I would like to extend uh, a question towards you mostly and to invite you to a dialogue concerning how can we uh, understand what Nishida says about art in the context of what is going on today at the present mom moment in, on the art scene. So, as we all know, um, Nishida is uh, taking uh, um, his art theory um, at his forming his art theory at the intersection of uh, Zen thought and philosophy. Uh, like we said before, it's always between Western and Eastern cultural identities and practices. But at this point, we encounter in his writings some novel concepts on beauty, creative intuition, and action, or aesthetic experience. This art theory is one that takes form in the space between absolute nothingness and the legacy of Buddhism. And we shall concentrate on this in order to clarify the role art plays in Nishida's philosophy and the way its importance gradually changes and evolves. And uh, we've mentioned even yesterday at the round table that it's, uh, it's this, this dialogue between art and philosophy and the fact that you should maybe uh, practice what you preach in the sense that you write about art but you're also practicing art. We can see this in Nishida as well, because he practiced calligraphy, he was writing poetry and so on. So he uses art, the concept of art, not only in a theoretical level, but also as a crutch sometimes to illustrate other more abstract ideas he's trying to introduce in his work. Uh, for example, in Art and Morality, we are told by Nishida that in art, expression itself is truth, and philosophy and art are in constant connection and react to one another. Later on, in his mature period, in, uh, from the actor to the seer, Nishida confesses he seeks to give a philosophical foundation to what he considers to be the source of Asian culture, seeing the form of the formless and hearing the sound of the soundless, Grounded in the idea of nothingness, Japanese aesthetics have for him the distinctive quality of employing form to express the formless. And I will follow this across uh, the boundaries of space and time uh, in order to clarify the role, um, uh, its role in Nishida's aesthetic theory. Uh, he, while being informed on Western writings, both old and new, concerning art history and philosophy, Nishida will come to treat the subject from a clearly Eastern standpoint, that of the way, though, of art, uh, a way that leads to liberation. Originating in expression, artistic creativity is equally a communication transcending various types of boundaries and constrictions, both in theory and in contemporary practice. It marks an absolutely contradictory self-identity and stems from an ordinary, true, empty heart for Nishida. And so, in place of a conclusion, like I said, I will, in the end, and this will come at the end of my uh, speech, um, I will try to extend the question on how could we understand today's art uh, through Nishida Kitaro's theory of aesthetics and how could we maybe more easily understand his philosophy through some artistic uh, manifestations uh, going on today. And is it still possible to talk about uh, his uh, absolute nothingness in the context of what we have today in a museum, on, in the context of the space of an artistic uh, exhibition? 
Um, although one might be tempted to consider aesthetics uh, a marginal, almost absent theme in the writings of Nishida, thoughts on artistic creation, like I said, uh, go through uh, the whole work, his whole work, and help consolidate his philosophy, starting from one of his first essays, An Explanation of Beauty, Bino Setsume, which was written 10 years prior to uh, Zen no Kenkyu, and continuing with texts such as Art and Morality in 1923, or Fundamental Problems of Philosophy in the 30s, up until artistic creation as an act of historical formation in 1941, he steadily elaborates his thoughts on what art is. Bringing together ideas from both Western philosophy and Japanese aesthetics, he begins to establish in Bino Setsume his definition of beauty and art. Uh, taking briefly into account uh, Marshall's definitions of beauty, it's a psychological, mostly, view on art, uh, that defines beauty as stable pleasure. He then turns towards the German idealist tra uh, tradition and examines the Kantian idea of beauty as disinterested pleasure, which he then proceeds, though, to reinterpret in the terms of Zen. The European nation of momentary pleasure takes, at this point for Nishida, the image of Muga, of no self and ecstasy, and then transforms itself anticipating the later pure experience and the idea of Zetaimu uh, into the intuitive truth, Chokkaku Teki no Shinri, that allows us to separate from the self and become one with things. Together with morality and religion, art at this point arises from selflessness, self-effacement, and self-emptying. And I will quote uh, a passage from Bino Setsume in which Nishida states the following. If you want to obtain an authentic sense of beauty, you must confront things in the state of pure muga. The sense of beauty arises through this essential condition known as divine inspiration of art. If the sense of beauty is as I have described above, what kind of thing produces it? In other words, what kind of thing do we call beauty? Everyone agrees that beauty is truth, that it is something that comes into existence in an ideal reality. Beauty that evokes the feeling of Muga is intuitive truth that transcends intellectual discrimination. This is why beauty is sublime. As regards this point, beauty can be explained as the discarding of the world of discrimination and the being one with the great way of Muga. I end here my quote. And continuing this line of thoughts, this initial from this initial essay, his first uh, writings on art. Uh, in the later work, Art and Morality, we encounter the idea that expression, Hyogen, itself is truth, in the sense that, uh, as he will later reformulate it and explain, re explain it in Fundamental Problems of Philosophy, artistic creativity should arise from the fact that actions are essentially expressive. Art must be a revelation of life but the artistic should be thought to exist at the point where individual and universal become one in the determination of place, Basho. The essence of art must be traced to the creative act of the artist. Indeed, appreciation too may be thought to be grounded on the kind of creative act as the connoisseur also appreciates a, world, a work of art through a vicarious participation in the creative act of the artist. The essence of the beautiful must thus be sought in the subjective act on the one hand, but we cannot help thinking on the other that a beautiful, things, uh, a beautiful thing exists objectively for our aesthetic judg judgment. Even if aesthetic content is not an existential or existent quality of a thing, aesthetic content becomes an object of aesthetic feeling in some sense. The artist himself becomes for Nishida a place where the knower and the known become one, and the beautiful or aesthetic dimension comes to stand at the very foundation of existence. The concept of self-awareness as well, present in his uh, large work, takes uh, a preeminent place. He says that in the actual will, subject and object are one, and the self functions in the horizon of behavior. This is precisely the horizon of absolute will. 
to enter into true reality that is the object of uh, this kind of actual will uh, is aesthetic activity. To enter into this reality, the whole body must become one living power, one activity. So at this point, the body of an artist, but not only because the viewer is also included here, becomes uh, one living power and one activity in itself. The uh, state of art is that of pure consciousness, and it creates as well as uh, experiences um, from the point of uh, pure consciousness. The content, uh, the content of aesthetic beauty is not objective space, which is an intellectual object, but it is a subjective space that continues to function internally as the unifying force of perception itself. We can find here uh, a heavy influence of uh, Fiddler's thought on consciousness, expressivity, and reality that he developed uh, in On the Origin of Aesthetic Activity. This was not only this work, but his work in general was a big influence in, uh, in Nishida's thought and subsequently in Kyoto School. And um, at this point though, for Nishida, the meditation on the expressive movement of thought, that is the creative act of the artist, leads to the world of concept suddenly breaking up and the prospect of a world of infinitive visual perception opening up. In this moment, life is the fusion of subject and object, appearing when the self becomes thing and the thing becomes self. From here on, art is no longer the mystical, mysterious unity of prior writings, the Muga, but a dynamic reciprocity generating the whole world. The visual act entrains the movement of the whole body and opens up the possibility of traveling through several worlds at once. This experience of art and through it of reality is a pure experience for Nishida. The moment of, uh, I quote, the moment of seeing a color or hearing a sound, for example, is prior not only to the thought that the color or sound in the activity of an external object or that one is sensing it, but also to the judgment of what the color or sound might be. In this regard, pure experience is identical with direct experience. When one directly experiences one's own state of consciousness, there is not yet a subject or an object, and knowing and its object are completely unified. The turn is made at this point in Nishida's writings towards the concept of pure intuition, leading to the state of subject-object oneness and a fusion of knowing and willing in which the self becomes an open space. Even in, uh, in inquiry into the good, we can find echoes of this idea. Here he writes that there is no fundamental distinction between things and the self, for just as the objective world is a reflection of the self, so is the self a reflection of the objective world. And then, in, from the actor to the seer, Nishida brings into discussion artistic intuition as the reflection of an object on a consciousness that has become true nothingness. The scope of this reflection for Nishida, especially related to the Eastern aesthetics, is to see the form of the formless and hear the voice of the voiceless and to grasp the voice of the heart. And so um, in his later works, in artistic creation as an act of historical formation, Nishida turns around from his earlier influences in art theory and the creation of art is reconsidered as being the activity of history, uh, crea uh, the activity of history creation, rekishiteki sozo sayo, instead of approaching it from the perspective of the subjective conscious self. This leads to a discussion on the differences between Western and Eastern art, but one that leaves way to believe there is a possible communication between the two. So. Art at this point is essentially practical and physical and it's an abstraction whose language is also practical and bodily. It has to do with the body. Expression is the, uh, is the sum of all the subjective moments through which the historical world forms itself. And in this dialectical world, the artistic process is an abstraction from uh, active intuition in a world that can be interpreted at the same time as identical and contradictory. 
the process of art must be uh, in this way the same everywhere. There must be a common ground with uh, different artistic will, which makes the difference between what he calls Western and Japanese art. Uh, the space of the heart is the space of Eastern art for Nishida, and the space of things is that of Western art. And I will quote at this point that it can be said in a broad stroke that the Oriental culture developed having subjectivity as its central focus, while objectivity has the central focus of the Western culture. Western culture has the horizontal extension, while the Oriental culture a vertical extension. Where these two paradigms get un unified, we can think about a global culture. The future of the culture will probably be heading in this direction. The idea that the Oriental culture is not yet fully developed and that when it will have fully developed, it will grow into Western culture is the wrong way to approach this question of human cultures. Each culture stands on independent footing and develops accordingly. And in this sense, Western, like I said, Western art concentrates on the form, while Eastern art concentrates on the formless. Um, now, the problem is, could we apply this kind of theory, which at some point, although Nishida constantly works on his ideas and it's, it's a constant development, but could we apply it uh, practically in today's art? And I have here three examples of uh, experiments, let's say, happening now, today, in art, and I would like to ask you if you could maybe trace a connection between this and what Nishida says about art, or if it's something completely different. The first one, it's a, a contemporary installation, although uh, Yayoi Kusama started doing this in since the 60s, in, uh, um, in a series of infinity mirrored rooms. And when talking about uh, this concept, Yayoi Kusama says the following, my desire was to predict and measure the infinity of the unbounded universe from my own position in it with dots, an accumulation of particles forming the negative spaces in the net. How deep was the mystery? Did infinites exist beyond our universe? In exploring these questions, I wanted to examine the single dot that was my life. So this is also a question of negative spaces, of one's position in the universe, of what space means and what body means in the end. And again, when the image is given freedom, Kusama says, it overflows the limits of time and space. So is this a liberated form of art? And if yes, is this also a liberated form of being? The second example is um, <laughs> uh, it's similar to what you saw earlier with the uh, experiment in calligraphy. This uh, took place at the actual Nishida Kitaro Museum of Philosophy. There is also a video which I don't have with me right now but you can find on the website. Um, it was called Absence of the Tea Master, and I will give you here parts of the press release, the actual words of the artists and the organizers concerning this concept. This was a performance initi initiated by a foreign artist and a Japanese one, and it was, it, they tried to make special use at this point 
uh, of the central place. Uh, I think you mentioned Tadoan Do. I heard his name mentioned. So they wanted to take advantage both of his architecture and uh, and the the idea uh, that Nishida has about this kind of spaces. So it's dedicated to his thoughts on nothingness, but it's also uh, uh, um, a dialogue with modern architecture. <coughs> and these are just some stills from the video. And these are the actual words of the organizers. Negotiating differences in Eastern and Western concepts of space, social relations, body and nature, art and its representation, drove the artistic process. The concept developed by uh, Margaret Whitmer and Akane Nakamori is based on a reinterpretation of traditional Japanese tea ceremony but inviting new thoughts about the value of ancient rituals and relations between political powers and the body. The role of the tea master was interpreted by a contemporary dancer. Uh, there was a soundscape uh, composed by a contemporary uh, musician, uh, choreography, everything was inspired by the, the design of the place and uh, the writings of Nishida on nothingness. So, are his writings still inspiring artists today to try and develop new ways of understanding what nothing else is? And this is my third example, uh, something that it's, has become really popular this year. Uh, it's uh, a concept by Team Lab. They already opened last month uh, a whole museum in Tokyo. And their, their ideas on what art is and how you can play with it are really interesting and I think they echo this kind of uh, theory and philosophy of art that Nishida uh, uh, developed before. So this is again from their press release. These are their exact words. And I wonder if they were inspired, directly inspired or not, by uh, the, the tradition that uh, came before them. They say here that people move freely, form connections and relationships with others, and recognize the world through their own bodies. The body has a concept of time. In the mind, the boundaries between different thoughts are ambiguous, causing them to influence and sometimes intermingle with each other. Artworks, too, can move freely, form connections and relationships with people, and have the same concept of time as the human body. While the artwork remains autonomous, they transcend the boundaries between the works, influence and sometimes intermingle with each other. This is one borderless world created by a group of such works. People lose themselves in the artwork world. The borderless works transform according to the presence of people. As we immerse and meld ourselves into this unified world, we explore a new relationship that transcends the boundaries between people and between people and the world. For example, the flow of water in this uh, experiment uh, continues to transform due to the interaction of people. Previous visual states can never be replicated and will never reoccur. So this is a group of artworks that forms one borderless world. Uh, artworks that move out of, the, uh, out of the rooms freely, form connections and relationships, relationships with people, communicate with other works, influence and sometimes intermingle with each other. The team lab has uh, as its scope to create new experiences with others, immerse yourself as, to make you immerse yourself as a viewer 
in this borderless art and explore the world with your own body. People understand and recognize the world through their bodies, moving freely and forming connections and relationships with others. As a consequence, the body has its own sense of time. In the mind, the boundaries between different thoughts are ambiguous, causing them to influence and sometimes intermingle with each other again. So the word borderless that has come up in this uh, uh, conference as well expresses the museum's aim to tear down the borders between one art and another, between art and visitors, and oneself and others, by allowing visitors to melt into the art and become part of it. The Mori Building and Team Lab hope that their a uh, groundbreaking museum will inspire people to create enlightened new values and innovative new social frameworks. And they aim to explore a new relationship between human and the world through art. The collective's collaborative practices seek to liberate art from physical connections and constrictions and transcend boundaries in contemporary society where the border between technologies and creativity is becoming fuzzy. So this was it. <laughs> it's mostly my thoughts on what I'm coming from the point of view of contemporary art. And from this point of view, I'm going towards Nishida and I'm just starting to work on his uh, writings. But I would like to extend to you the question, could we maybe understand his work by looking at this kind of visual and like participating in this kind of visual artistic experience. Thank you My very presentation. Much. Yeah. So, yeah, we have 15 minutes for questions and comments. My opinion would be that the new technologies definitely bring something more to not only how art is expressed, but how you experience it as a viewer and as a participant. And I wouldn't say it goes beyond what philosophy says about art. I think it's just continuing its communication with it and being in a constant a dialogue with it and trying to bring something new every time. It's always trying to go up to the border and then surpass it and see how far you can actually go. And I think that although, for example, I was mentioning that Kusama was doing her uh, Infinity Mirrors since the 1960s and they had the same concept then as they have now, only that now they are enhanced, let's say, the, the experience itself when you step inside the room is enhanced by all these technological advances. So indeed it might become more intense, it might become more clear due to this, but I think the idea behind it remains the same. Mm -hmm. 
thank you for your presentation. Uh, first, I'm sorry for my late coming because uh, for my presentation it's something today. I'm sorry. And uh, one comment and one question. And the one question is, um, um, you come together uh, all of Nishida's philosophy, maybe, but uh, I think, uh, especially in his earlier philosophy and uh, later philosophy, uh, can can be easily come came together. Mm. So I'm afraid to that. And uh, for instance, uh, the notion of nothingness. Because uh, you know uh, the no Kenku in inquiry to the good, uh, we can say them or uh, fundamental we can never, but uh, only few words about that. I think fundamental or authentically we can never uh, find the notion of nothingness in that book. I think. But of course uh, in middle age, uh, in his middle phase, uh, that notion was coming. But uh, it was gradually changed, its meaning was gradually changed and changing to the, uh, he, in his later or last period. So I want to be, yeah, I want to indicate that uh, uh, you carefully mention, you carefully investigate or examine the difference between the phrases, the phases, sorry, the phases of this philosophy. Is that a comment? And, but uh, it's uh, related to my question. Because, uh, yes, um, the pictures of art are very contemporary as a very fast one. And um, you, maybe you illustrated um, or explained these parts by the notion of borderless, maybe. But uh, mm. can it fit to the no Nishida's notion of nothingness? Of course, uh, in a sense it can, but uh, in another sense cannot, because the mm. nothingness does not mean only the borderless, or uh, in the main, much more, mm. because uh, the nothingness, um, of course, includes uh, individuality, and uh, especially in the in his later phase, uh, the nothingness, the notion of nothingness. So the meaning of nothingness is slightly changing, and uh, it expresses that uh, maybe he doesn't he doesn't use the notion of nothing that you know, motion technique although it's uh, other senses. But anyway, um, in short, the nothingness determines or expresses into the individual, and uh, it equal to the self expression of individual itself. So it doesn't mean only borderless mm. or uh, something uh, deep individualization, individualization, I think so. And uh, in my guess, uh, you can illustrate this con con contemporary art by that notion, I think. So maybe in short um, explanation this art by Nishita thinking it, was, it, it, it could be or it is right, but uh, I think not only by the notion of the borders. Mm. It's my question. No, it's just an example. I'm not limiting it to the notion of border. It's just that this kind of um, development of art that tries to surpass borders and limitations and create new concepts on what the body is and what our perception of art is, uh, for example, and what the space not only of art but of the individual is in, in the world today. Uh, I think all of these can be traced back to, of course, his writing his own art. And when I say art, I'm not only thinking about uh, it from the perspective of nothingness, but also what it means for uh, being in the world, what it means for the individual to create, and so on. So it's, it's, this is just a starting point. This is just an interesting, I think, um, connection between what a philosopher said in the last century about art and what one might think it's maybe obsolete and 
it, it's, it's connected to what is happening right now in the art world, especially in Japan, and how this actually echoes ideas that we find, we find not only in Nishida, but also in the larger cultural background of Japanese stuff. So I, it's just a starting point for me to see, and I thank you for your opinion as well, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, maybe start a dialogue concerning this kind of possible connection between theory and practice. And the question of can art actually help us better understand easily or more profoundly understand philosophy with this kind of uh, happenings and manifestations and uh, declared purposes of transgressing borders and redefining what's art and artists and um, our um, experience of art means today. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a question about this um, museum by the team lab. Mm -hmm. is, it, uh, is it interactive? Because you, you said something like that the, uh, yes. the actions of the, the, the museum uh, audience that it changes something. Because well, I think it, uh, especially interesting for me for um, uh, considering Nishida's uh, position in, in understanding art or thinking about new ways of art is his later philosophy and not so much his uh, early philosophy of pure mm -hmm. experience. And I think in his later ex uh, um, philosophy there is this um, kind of um, trying to grasp something like complexity and determination. So he's thinking about this um, different levels of the individual, the species and the, the genus and how on every level there are kind of multiplicities which um, determine themselves and at the same, same time determining, determining each other and determining the place in which they occur. Mm. And this kind of overlap of of um, feedback loops and loops between these feedback loops and the, the place in which they occur. This, for me, this is a very interesting kind of um, vision, which which I would like to find uh, maybe in something like this, where they create a whole space, not just the single like uh, singular um, works of art, but a whole space of arts which uh, communicate with each, uh, mm -hmm. each other. So. Yes, yes, that's, well, I'm also mostly interested in that later part of mm -hmm. his work, but uh, as I'm trying to thoroughly understand how this evolves, I just made uh, a quick, like, passing through from the start to how it develops in the later works. And indeed, this is, uh, well, this first image is from uh, an exhibition they had right now in France. They went there because they are celebrating uh, Meiji and their re Japan's relationship with France. Um, and there are many, many activities of uh, uh, Japanese artists in uh, Paris right now. And, but this is one example, and they have the whole building in Tokyo, where indeed you can interact with the art. Everything is changeable and you can modify everything you touch in inside the space. So this is maybe uh, close to the concept of uh, ichiyo ichie. <laughs> like it, this is one time, one experience, this is happening right now and you cannot replicate it afterwards. But it's also a, what the other does in the same space influences how you perceive the art and how it changes for you as well. So this is, everything is connected and it's indeed a fascinating use of technology today. I think it's, it's uh, an amazing experience for me and it really plays with our perception of the world in the end, not only of what art is. So yes, everything is interactive, and it's room after room after room that all connect with each other. Yeah, last question. Thank you for so much for your presentation. This is not a question, but mostly a 
Thank, I wait to tell you thank you. My research field is strictly Buddhist studies, and so I am relatively new to these points of view in philosophy. I have uh, had the occasion during my Master of Arts of seeing Yayoi Kusama's uh, <laughs> installation, especially the Infinity Mirrored Room, but you gave me a new way of interpretation because I have always seen it like the, for example, like for example the infinite Indra net in mm -hmm. Buddhism, but also like the um, way in which Fatsang, one of the patriarchs of the Huayan school in China, Kegon in uh, Japan, uh, gave his, uh, demonstrated his doctrine uh, to the court, uh, to the Tang court, uh, in, to the imperial court in China. He used exactly a mirror of, me all covered of mirrors, a uh, room covered in mirrors, and each mirror reflected a Buddha image. So it was quite, it was really interesting to me to see this artwork in a different way, uh, which is far but connected at the same time with the strict Buddhist doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see how uh, these points or different points of view compenetrate each other. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, having given me uh, a new way to interpret art, uh, far from uh, the one I have ever had experienced. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the uh, last big thank you to both speakers. Thank <laughs> you.